Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Kara Welke. I'm the creator of the Next Level Occupational Therapy Platform. And I am super excited today because I have with me Sarah and Joanna, who are both certified occupational therapy assistants who have started their own businesses. I teach occupational therapy assistant students, and I just love that. Um, OT, I mean, I, I love the fact that these two have started their own businesses, and I can't wait to share this um, podcast and YouTube video because they're going to post it on both um, with those students because I try to encourage them all the time to think bigger. So, first of all, we're going to hear from Sarah. Sarah has over 16 years of experience analyzing movement in various settings. Um, her background over the past eight years has been as a COTA, which has given her a holistic lens in which she looks at health and wellness. She is a NSCA certified personal trainer and has a BS in physical education and a 200 hour yoga or and is a 200 hour yoga instructor. She started her own company, Sensational Movement, to teach yoga to children and personal training to individuals who are looking for more than just a workout. So Sarah, we'll have you go first and just tell us, first of all, we'll start with telling us about your business. Um, my business is a Sensational Movement and it is based off the senses of the body. So I mainly focus on proprioception, vestibular, and interoception, um, which all can be combined through exercise and yoga. Uh, I've learned a lot working with kids, so I have a passion for that. However, I still have a passion for working with adults too. Um, and so I wanted to combine both of my ideas and teach both. So um, I'll be doing some children's yoga classes and they will look in into both of those little lenses of uh, the sensory system um, and incorporating all of that. And the same thing um, as we age, um, learning about how we can incorporate midline activities um, through proprioception and vestibular input to improve um, without having to do so much heavy lifting and things that may hurt the body in the long run, um, learning to listen to our body systems um, while we're personal training. So giving um, feedback and learning to listen to your body, um, those things will be incorporated in my sessions. So that's where um, the eight in sensational movement comes from. Um, so we'll be incorporating all the senses. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the overview of the business part. <laughs> that's awesome. So um, how long did you, or how long have you been thinking about starting a business? Have you um, known you always wanted to have one or? I have as long as I can remember. Um, I've been interested in it. It's one of those things that seems very overwhelming to start. Um, once you get started, it's really not too bad, so. So how long or when did you actually start building this business? Um, actually the beginning of June. Um, okay. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, this, okay. This, um, I would say school year, last school year, um, it's been in my mind. So I've been pondering how exactly I was gonna do things and shifting from idea to this idea and how it was going to look exactly. Um, Cause I just couldn't, and I know they tell you to narrow your market, but I just really enjoy both things. So I wanted to incorporate both because that's me and I didn't wanna shift away from that. So um, that's where it both came in. So what was the, um... What kickstarted you to do it this June versus a little bit before when, since you said you've always been wanting to do this? I really I wanted know. to uh, not go back to my job. <laughs> 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 I love, I love the setting I was in. I was in schools. Okay. Um, I've been in pediatric outpatient, but there's so many constraints as far as like seeing things that you don't like for the children, <laughs> which yep. is terrible, but um you know, I want to see them playing more and I want to see them right. at recess and just little things like that, that bother me, I guess you can say. I want to uh, be promoting good health. And I felt like sometimes I was going against the grain. So um, I was ready to try something new. And that reminds me of 
today on the Facebook um, group, Next Level OT, we were, I put a poll up, do you want clinical freedom, financial freedom, time freedom? And that makes me think of the clinical freedom. And that's one thing that pushed me to open my own business is so I didn't have someone constraining what I do and how I do it. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, what were some of the first steps you took to get this business off the ground for other OTAs or COTAs that want to do this? Um, I first started with SCORE, um, okay, good. which is a business organization that is nonprofit, so they provide you with a mentor, um, a free mentor. I actually went to a business class first, um, and they gave you some little tidbits about um, like where to put, uh, open up a bank account, and just little things like that, stuff that I wouldn't have thought of. Right. Um, and so it was another contact uh, as well. So you, there were other business, new business members, old business members of the community um, getting together to talk about that. So that's kind of where I started. Um, and then I just kind of pieced little by little together. So um, I ran a class out of a neighboring communities gym just to kind of see if there was anything and if how I felt about it as well. And I've started doing a little bit of personal training there as well, um, just to kind of get my feet wet, see how I like it. Um, and then that pushed me into the next step, which was having some marketing um, somewhere for people to go, um, which turned into a Facebook page first, and then toying around with the website, which I don't know how, but I did it on my own. <laughs> and it <laughs> so looks amazing. It, I love it. Thank you. It can be done because I am not techie. I'll be honest with you. In college, I failed web page, de page design the first time. <laughs> I had to take it again and still had to have a lot of help. Um, and even at that, man, lots of things have changed in web page design in 10 years. So um, it was all new to me. So if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> what did you use to build your website? I just used a Wix website. Okay. Um, yeah. And I started with the profile, like, uh, I, sorry, I can't remember what it's exactly called, but it kind of sets you up um, on its own. It kind of plugs everything in for you, but then you can go back and change whatever you want. So you can, okay. back, you just can't go back the opposite direction. So you can't go forward, backwards, and then forwards again. So okay. you go back, you got to stay there. But once it's kind of plugged in for you, it makes it a lot easier. Okay. Um. And do you do individual sessions and groups? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. And how did you decide how to go as far as like payment? Because I know a lot of people have questions about that. Um, as far as the yoga goes, um, I kind of looked in the area to see what people were charging. So I mm -hmm. compared a lot of gymnastic centers, dance centers, because those are more child related. But I also looked at adult yoga um, to kind of see what people were paying in the area. Um, so I kind of took my prices from that and what I feel comfortable as well. Cause that's always something you don't want to, you can always add on later too, right, but you know, you right. start yourself too small. So, um, as far as the personal training prices, uh, I'm physically going, if I go into a home, um, I have to charge a little bit more. Um, right. Whereas if people are going to be back to back in a studio, I feel like I can charge a little bit less. Um, so I did post some payments, but you know, depending on the situation, I can always change that. But. Okay. And it's all cash based, right? Yes. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic. I'll have more questions for you later, okay, but you. Um, I think this is a great um, example of how OTAs can start a business and it doesn't have to necessarily be, providing OT services, you're using your passions and your areas of interest and tying it all together. So I love that. Okay, Joanna, let's go with you next. So Joanna is the owner and director of OT and Me LLC. She's been practicing for 11 years. Her, she has her associates in occupational therapy and a bachelor's degree in health sciences. Um, and her bachelor's in health science is from Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry, New York. OT and Me LLC is a home and community-based pediatric practice. They provide OT evaluations, treatment, and consultation services by a traditional OT model. 
They also provide advocacy and special needs family coaching through a non-traditional OT model or through a non-traditional OT lens. So I'm excited to hear about your business, Joanna. Can you tell us all about it? Um, so I started back in February. Um, the whole business idea has been something that um, I definitely have wanted to do for a long time, but I hadn't really been in the right place um, personally. I've got two kiddos and a husband and the new house, and we finally uh, sent our youngest off to kindergarten this year. So it was time to uh, take more on because I am uh, always moving and shaking. I am not a stagnant person. Um, maybe uh, that would not be the best thing in my husband's eyes. <laughs> but I'm always growing and moving and learning and I got bored. You know, I had never, you know, stayed at one job in one place in one setting for more than a few years because it was just stagnant. So I'm a school-based OT full-time, OTA obviously, um, full-time. And while I love that and I work with multiply disabled and severe and profound disabilities, that also kind of pinholes you in to um, certain things in a school-based setting that really crosses boundaries between school-based and clinic-based and what's supposed to be worked on in school. And it's just so exhausting to navigate that with administration and parents and parents who want for their children. And in my area, there are not options for outpatient OT, not in pediatrics. There's lots of facilities for adults. Um, there is a local children's hospital that offers OT, but the waiting list is 18 months long. Oh, wow. And they only accept if their doctors, their internal doctors, recommend the OT. So other than that, there's one clinic that's very tiny, um, and there's no other options. So I felt like, you know, I lived in New York for a long time, got my degree there. Everything there was much more sensory-based. And uh, that was just kind of the path that people took. And I saw such positive things. I actually managed um, like the office side while I was in school of a sensory clinic. So I got to see that firsthand and see the successes. And I just wanted to bring that here. You know, I'm in central Pennsylvania. It's not quite as cutting edge. And <laughs> I just really was sad that those things were lacking in this area and that there just weren't services available. So that's kind of what got me started. That's awesome. And yeah, to identify such a, I mean, it sounds like you have a huge need in that area to get started. And it also uh, sounds the like- marketing piece underway. <laughs> yeah. You know? And it also sounds like um, when we talk about that financial freedom, clinical freedom, time freedom, the clinical freedom again, is a big one for you and why you wanted you know, to start it's when, we, when we talk about it i see that it is the clinical freedom in my mind it's of course the financial freedom in right. my mind i'm like well i want to you know own a business and i want to do well for my family and i don't initially go oh i do want the clinical freedom but then whenever i talk about it that's exactly where it goes right right so um how how long were you thinking about starting this business before you started it in February? I started brainstorming probably last September. So it's just been about a year since I just started like putting ideas on paper and thinking about names and thinking about what my niche was going to be and that kind of thing. Um, but I really never, you know, set it aside. I progressively worked on it since last September. And just in February is when I filed my paperwork and got my LLC and, and all that stuff to kind of get moving. And then I immediately took my first client. So obviously, you know, with kiddos, the summer was exciting. And now that's kind of dying down a little bit. Um, but I've been working on it almost exactly a year now. Okay. And that kind of with your kiddos in the summer, did you kind of take a little time off from the private practice? Well, no, I actually had a lot of clients over the summer. Oh, you summer. had a lot of clients over the summer? Okay. Their parents aren't getting the services at school, which is the only right. place they expect to receive them in our area. You know, then they kind of start putting their feelers out and talking and going, well, what can I do? You know, we're sitting at home. Yeah. Um, how can I, you know, help them during this time? So I got pretty lucky because obviously my colleagues are other school-based OTs, um, so they know all the kids in the area. Um, so I have a few referrals from them 
kids that didn't necessarily qualify for school-based services, but still needed something, so. Awesome, well, I know one big question people are gonna have is, how can you, um, with being a COTA, um, run a business and do like the evaluations and things like that? So my mind automatically went to OT as traditional OT. Um, I maybe am not so much of a think outside the boxer. Um, so mad respect to Sarah who, who had a good plan there. Um, my mind was, of course I have to do OT. I'm an OTA, so I have to do OT. Like what else would I do? Um, so I was talking to some OTR friends of mine and one previous colleague who's I now consider a friend, um, said, well, why can't you, you know, just, just get an OTR. And I was like, what do you mean get an OTR? Like, I can't go shopping for an OTR. And she's <laughs> like, you certainly can. So I said to her, I was like, well, you should just be my OTR. And she's like, okay. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, so she is a 1099 contractor for me. And her and I together do dual practitioner evaluations. Um, so we both administer different parts of that. We discuss before um, how we proceed. We do, you know, use different um, software and forms and things like that to kind of structure our evaluations. Um, but we do it together. And then I write up my part. She writes up her part. We discuss our plan of care. And then as far as like changes of plan of care you know we do some consultation on that and we do our supervision my state practice act in pennsylvania requires 10 percent supervision so 10 percent of whatever direct time i have with clients um so that's an easy calculation for us and we get mm -hmm. together you know once a month in person but then also you know we talk all the time you know via text or the phone or email about things that are going on or you know if i think one thing I'll check with her on her opinion and it just works. Well, it sounds like it works better than probably the majority of other situations out there. I mean, you think of, well, I think of in my situation, and of course I work with older adults, but the OT goes and does the evaluation. COTA does the treatment. They don't really collaborate. They say they do, but do they? And developing that partnership is awesome. Yeah, it's nice. The, the dual practitioner eval is like something I'm really proud of. Something that, like, I think that, you know, we, I say that to a parent and they're like, oh, okay, you know, like that sounds like a quality service. You know, you've got yeah. two professional sets of eyes. She has tons of SOS training and um, lots of knowledge in that area. And she does EI um, full time. So she's really great with that younger eye and I work all the way up through high school and school base. So together I feel like we cover a lot. Well, yeah, no, yeah, that's just wonderful. Um, okay. So how about payment wise? Are you cash based or take insurance? We are an out of network provider. So okay. we're cash based and we provide the claims for the families. However, okay. um, my new, my new exciting adventure is to get credentials. Okay. So I okay. am, I just did my CAQH and I just, yep. you know, got online and started figuring out, I know which insurances most families in the area have. There are some bigger ones. Um, so I've just started pulling up every Google doc I could find on payment schedules and, and what, what I'm seeing and asking around and what other people are seeing. So that's the next hurdle. That's exciting. Um, yeah. And why did you decide to do that instead of staying cash based? I'm finding in our area, I can expand my clientele. Uh, I think a lot of people, I wouldn't say that we're a socioeconomically depressed area at all. I just don't think that people consider OT a priority because there aren't sensory clinics in the area, because it's not something that is in people's faces. Hey, this is available to you. I can help you. Um, it does just tend to be like a school service and it kind of takes the back burner then. Right. So I feel like people aren't willing to just hand over cash for something that they don't know much about. Right. Right. Yeah. It does take, I mean, where you're living and the population and what you're doing does make a difference. Yeah. Um, do you do all individual sessions? I do. Okay. Um, 
we, I have chatted with a family about doing some group sessions, but it's so tricky to find kiddos that are going to work. You know, my scope is kind of big when it comes right. to, you know, what it's a lot of developmental delay, but what does that look like? And so we're not really necessarily focusing on the social skills because in our area, that's something that a lot of counselors are focusing on. So I'm not finding that it really is going to just kind of work out the right way to do groups. You know, okay. it's always yep. an option, but right. just hasn't and landed there. Do you see yourself always being home-based? No. <laughs> my <laughs> my five-year plan is a sensory. Awesome. Plan. My okay. five-year plan is to, to get this area on board, <laughs> to, to, to show them how much sensory intervention um, can improve outcomes. I think that in Pennsylvania, ABA is very popular. Mm -hmm. And I know in the OT world, very controversial. Mm -hmm. But I just think that there are ways that we could be collaborating and working together. Um, you know, there are so many functional skills that these kids need. And there are so many positives that can come from that sensory input, just to improve the outcomes of even like an ABA session. So right. I just think uh, I've, I've got big dreams, but it's a five-year plan. So hopefully we're on the right track. Well, that's what they teach us to do, though, is dream big and set the goals. And that sounds awesome. And I know other people that started out, out doing the home-based and that worked perfect to draw them in to be able to do a clinic setting. And you kind of have that population or clientele that just follows you into the clinic. So how about hiring other staff? Do you foresee that in your future? You know, I do. I have a CODA friend. Um, where we live, there's a large river that runs through the area. So it's the East Shore and the West Shore. Um, and I'm on the East Shore. And so we've already talked about if I'm to get any referrals for the West Shore, that she'll take those on. Um, so hopefully um, we will get there and we will grow. Um, at this point, well, then I'll have to figure out um, since CODAs can't be 1099s, right. um, the employee thing. But I think that that'll work out because, you know, she's a newer CODA, but she's phenomenal. Right. Um, so I think it might work out as far as salary requirements go and having to do the employee piece. Yep, yep. And, I mean, there's always people and places that can help you um, with that employee part as well. I know I had my accountant set it all up and and kind of help guide me with that. So yeah, I definitely need an accountant there. <laughs> um, okay, so both of you awesome practices, both kind of, I mean, different perspectives and how you set it up and run and are running your practice and both fantastic. So what tips do you guys have for COTAs that want to start a business? Sarah, we'll start with you. Do you have one tip you would share? Um, go through SCORE. Uh, okay. They can set you up with a plan and things that you aren't going to think of otherwise. You can Google it all you want, but until you have somebody that is there for you, um, I think that's, that's your, your best first idea um, to get in contact with them. And my mentor gave me kind of like a checklist and showed me where to go for my business plan, um, kind of set me up. And then I just took it from there and ran. So um, that would be my first tip. Okay, awesome. We'll go to Joanna. What's one tip you have to share with people that want to start their practice? I think that this might um, lend itself to my personality a little bit, but it's just go for it. I just decided and I, I Googled a lot and I printed other people's web pages out and I printed their forms out. And I think I looked at 20 different clinics like in the mid Atlantic region of their forms that were posted online. And then I made my own based on that. And, you know, I had somebody look over it to make sure I was safe and I right. did a couple of legal zooms and things like that, but I just went for it and I'm still learning and I'm still finding things that I'm like, oh, I didn't do that the same way that they did. And then I'll consult somebody else and find either that I, what I'm doing is okay, or maybe I need to tweak it a little this way or that. But I just say, go for it. Just start. And that's, I mean, that's so true. So many people are so hesitant and just do it. Um, most mistakes are repairable and we learn from our mistakes, right? Exactly. So, okay, Sarah, do you have another tip you would share? 
I'm kind of on her, her wavelength. You got to just start. Um, there are many days I doubt myself more than the other. <laughs> and you just keep up and you keep going. Um, it's, it's always got to be there. You know, you can't keep putting it off to the side. You got to jump in. And even if you can just do a little bit each day, um, it all adds up to a lot. So um, I really think that if you can just kind of get started and start working, you don't have to make it full time at first. It doesn't have to be something you jump all the way into um, with two feet. Just take a little bit at a time and just start. Start. You just got to start. <laughs> awesome. Hey, it's Joanna. I think my other one is, you know, as a CODA, if you're looking at your traditional OT lens, it's find your OTR. You know, early on, I found my OTR, so I knew I, I had the confidence to do a traditional OT model. And I, without her and her saying, I'm by your side, you got this. Like, I'm going to stick through this. I'm available to you. Um, I have faith in you. Like, that was my kind of push but it was also like it was, gave me confidence knowing she was there because the legalities require it but also just kind of little peer pressure is good for people <laughs> yep yep exactly sarah do you have another tip you'd like to share um <laughs> i wasn't thinking that far ahead i know i'm putting you on the spot you are um let's see i i would say if you can dip your toe into the market at some point. Um, I say I like a lot of things and I want to do a lot of things, but I haven't actually done them. Um, I know my populations that I like and I, I know I can make it work, but do you really like what you're going to do? Um, Joanna's kind of already, if you're kind of trying to go a different path, um, than what you're, you're used to, I would say, try it first before you make it a business. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of things start with a class or start with a, um, a, a client and, and just kind of see if it's going to be your thing before you jump full ship. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Exactly. Okay. Joanna. Oh, you got me on this one. Third, I feel like there's like three through eight are all equally important. And that's like all of like, you know, the, the plan. And to me, it wasn't so much a business plan. It was more like, what is this going to look like for a parent? Because I'm pediatrics and I'm a mom. Um, I just felt like the plan I was putting in place wasn't so much a business plan as it was a, okay, I'm going to call Joanna and I'm going to call OT and me and what what's going to happen. So the way I set up my plan was like what I wanted to occur for that parent who called me. So that was, you know, intake paperwork. And, you know, I always do a consultation and I don't advertise it as being like free consultation, but, you know, I chat through on the phone about what my experience is and what they're experiencing and, you know, try to offer some support so that they feel comfortable with me. And then how does that proceed from there? It's the dual practitioner evaluation. You know, it's coming into a place where your child is comfortable to do treatment sessions. You know, it's knowing that I've got two practitioners that you've met and known and trusted to make decisions from here on out and things like that. So that was kind of how I formed my business plan. Okay, great. Um, I hear a lot out there. I mean, I, I hear, I've heard OTs say this, that COTAs can't start their own business. I've heard that. I've heard OTAs saying, well, I can't start a business. Um, what would you say to these people? Who wants to go first? I'll go. Okay. <laughs> Yep, you can go, Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, so I would say, why not? <laughs> why? Who's telling you why? Um, yeah. The only person that's in charge is you. Um, as long as you are following the rules of the state, um, as far as I'm not going necessarily to consider my personal training services or my yoga services OT. Um, I have a background in OT, which is going to help me look at things differently, but I'm not calling them OT services. Um, so just being aware of those kind of things. Um, if you do, then you need to have your 
OTR with you. So just paying attention to those little tiny things, but it has nothing to do with why you can or cannot start a business. Um, anybody can start a business. Anybody. Awesome. <laughs> hey, Joanna. I agree with Sarah. Why not? Like there is not any reason. There is not any law. There is not any rule that says the coda can't be the boss. And you know, the first time I ever posted on one of the Facebook networking groups, I'm a coda and I own my own private practice. One person, I don't remember who jumped, jumped. You can't be the boss of your OTR. That's a conflict of interest. And I just thought to myself, like, how immature are your relationships with your colleagues that that's where your mind goes? Like, I have very solid, professional, respectful relationships with my colleagues. And I did with my OTR also. You know, we're friends now and we hang out outside of work, but, you know, it's not like a best friend situation. It's not like I can't tell her how I really feel. I can't be afraid to hurt her feelings. You know, we just have a very respectful, um, communicative relationship. And I just, there hasn't even been an inkling of that being an issue. And that's awesome. Yeah. How frustrating. And I don't, I just, well, and hopefully this will be one step towards breaking that stigma or whatever you want to call it, that COTAs can start a business, but how frustrating is, I mean, you've had other people tell you that too, when you were first thinking about starting it. Was that correct, Joanna? Yeah. That, and that's the go-to. How can you be the boss of your OTR when they're supposed to be the boss of you? And if that's how you see an OTR coda relationship, like that's your first problem. You know, right. I can't fix that skewed view that you have. Right. You know, we're a collaborative team. You know, I'm not the assistant to the OTR. I'm the assistant to the process. And I own that process. And I own it in my business and I own it in my daily life. I'm not bossing anyone around. I'm just setting up the rules for my life and my business. And, you know, the OTR just kind of falls into that. And, you know, we've disagreed. You know, she says to me, I think maybe this approach. And I, I say, well, this seems to work better with this kiddo. And, you know, we find our middle ground. And I just, it's never been a problem. Sounds like you run it just like it should be run. So, <laughs> and I also like you point out the fact that we're not, or OTAs are not the assistant to the OT, to the process. And I think that gets misunderstood so much out there. Um, I've had, this is kind of going off topic, but I've had um, OTAs contact me before that they just don't know what to do because they feel like they're treated from the OTR that they're their assistant, you know, go clean this, go do that. And and that's just not the right relationship to have. So I love your collaborative approach and your dual evaluation. I mean, that's fabulous. Thank you. Okay. So you guys have offered lots of great information about your business, tips, um, what you would say to those that say COTAs cannot start a business. Is there anything else you would like to share with anyone out there listening? You don't have to have a business name, a motto, a web page. You don't have to have those things to get started. You don't. <laughs> as much as they tell you, sometimes you have to get your feet wet first and then it comes to you. All that stuff takes a long time. Yep. Good point. Good point. Joanna, do you have anything else you want to share? No, I just want to say, you know, Kara, you've been phenomenal and I'm so excited for you and your platform and everything that you've got going on. And I just think as OT practitioners, we all just need to support each other and grow and, you know, cheerlead for each other. And as you know, I hate to say, but there are mostly women in the OT field. Right. And if women just got on board and cheered for each other and supported each other, like big things, big things in the future. Yeah, I can agree. I'm totally agree. And it's just kind of weird how this all happened because I would have never guessed in a million years <laughs> that we'd be doing anything like this, let alone I'd be doing a podcast or YouTube or start the membership platform that nothing thought of it, but the group grew so fast and it just shows there's such a need out there. We're all trying to do our own thing when we can all help and support each other. So and same thing for starting a business. There is not information out there. It 
takes a lot of digging. So if we can all be there for each other and, you know, share our stories and share, you know, the steps and, and help, then more power to it because I couldn't find a single CODA who would talk to me right. about a business. I, you know, I had found out that there were two or three nationwide who I could email. Yep. And I emailed one, never got a response, emailed the second, never got a response, finally got a response from the third, but wouldn't share anything. Like it was top secret. I know people are like that. Well, and that's so one I just want to like, you know, scream from the rooftops, like yeah. do it and you can do it. And this is how you do it. Well, you guys will probably get contacted, I, I'm guessing. <laughs> but that was kind of one of my rules with my Facebook groups is um, to try to keep all those people that post in there, um, I sell this or I sell that, because I want people to be able to ask easy questions and, you know, get an answer for some of it. So, um, but yeah, and as far as the membership group, that's just kind of above and beyond for people that want even more training and mentorship and so forth. But I hope the Facebook group continues to provide people with enough support that they need to, to keep moving on. So, well, thank you both so very much. I am going to stop recording just here.